thank you thank you thank you so much for uh, yeah <laughs> again always my head is spinning so spinning yeah i was trying to <laughs> i'm sorry right. i was trying trying hard to avoid that <laughs> no i i mean i you know you can't change what it is right okay so this is your so now this is the chance for everyone that's here in the room with us to ask your question uh, show your chocolate. Uh, okay, good, very good. Robert, you will turn on your, you are welcome to turn on your camera. And I will ask, I've just asked you to unmute. So you are free to come on in. Yes, uh, do you hear me? Yes, Robert, welcome. Oh, I thank you very much. This is a very instructive, uh, you know, um, uh, exposure, uh, lecture, whatever. So my question to Talia is just that, uh, how, how can we understand the tempering process in a sous vide machine? Did you hear me? Yes, I did. Thank you. All right. Um, okay. So, very good question. Um, so, sous vide. If if I'm uh, help me understand, do you start with solid chocolate or liquid chocolate? A uh, liquid because I have to melt it first and put it, you know, in the you know under water with the circular thing, and let's say you know with liquid basically. And what temperature do you uh, hold it for your in your sous vide, or what is your temperature uh, profile for your sous vide? Well, I put the machine in one one five, like you know, uh, Fahrenheit, for okay. fifteen minutes, and put it down to I think eighty two or eighty three, and put it back up to um. I don't remember the, the 30, 32. I'm just mixing up, you know, the temperature here. Yes, yes. Thank you for that help converting. Yes, 32. Perfect. Okay, great. So I will, um, I can reference one of my slides, um, which refers to uh, what's going on. Okay, uh, what we're doing is we're, I'm going to quickly screen share here. Um, Uh, I'm not screen sharing yet, am I? Not yet. Okay. Yeah, if we can't do it, we can't do it, but let's 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 try. Okay, I'm intending to show you this slide. Can you see it? Are you looking? It. Okay, great. Okay, so what this slide shows is the temperature profile. So we're here we are at the uh, warm temperature give it in Celsius in this slide. And this would be your, your hot melting temperature up here that you mentioned. And then you bring it down to this cold point. What this does is all the cocoa butter molecules are free and uh, very mobile at this temperature. As we cool them down, we force them to slow down and then they bump into each other and they begin to crystallize. At this point, at this low temperature that you described in your second sous vide setting point, we have forced the molecules to slow down quickly and to form some crystals. We are well below the melting point of our favorite stable crystal, our form five, we're well below it here. And then we warm up to get rid of the low melting point materials. That's that's what you're doing. Understood. <clears throat> Does that make sense? Yes. Uh, uh, um, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a YouTuber. So when I went to YouTube, 
they put the machine, you know, as I mentioned, to 115, and they tell you to put some ice and, you know, to get rid of some hot, warm water and put some ice to provoke and to, you know, lower the temperature. And when it comes to, I think, 82 for 15 minutes, you, you could agitate, you know, the, you know, the plastic and the, the, you know, the mixture. And all of a sudden you got to just warm it up one more time. So I'm, I'm perfect. That's, that's, that's the point. Yep. And that's, that's exactly the point as well. I was going to ask you if there was any agitation involved, because if there wasn't any agitation, I was going to have to try this myself and see what kind of magic was involved because it always requires a cha change of temperature as well as what we call shearing in physics or agitation or stirring something that's going to move the molecules around and cause them to bump into each other. So we are physically trying to get those, think of those little blocks trying to organize. We're trying to get those things to bump into each other. Microscopic, we can't see it. It's invisible to our eyes. And we're trying to get them to bump into each other and line up by chance so that we can then form these little nuclei, these little baby crystals, and they start to organize and then we can grow them after we start using our chocolate. So thank you for that. Very nice. I appreciate your contribution today more than you know. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We have a question in the chat and then we have a hand raised. So I'm going to just quickly do the, um, well, not quickly. I'm going to do the question in the chat, and then we'll move to the to Jean, who has her hand raised. So, uh, can you explain what release marks are and how they can be avoided? Okay. So, give me one second here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to scoot ahead in my PowerPoint um, off to the side here. I have some release marks that I specially generated yesterday, just in case somebody asked, along with about. 50 other slides that I made. Okay, so I'm not going to show the 50 until somebody asks. I'm going to um, go back and screen share and uh, treat you to a little baby release marks picture. So I don't know if you can see this, but um, can you see my cursor by any chance? Um, am I screen sharing, in fact? Okay, so here. Yes. Here. Thank you. Here are, the, here are the release marks. Here's another little type of release mark. I was very, I felt very fortunate that I got two release marks for the price of one here. And uh, look, that goes back there. And so uh, what it is, I filled my mold and um, I'm going to stop sharing. But anyway, I filled my mold. And what happens is the chocolate is slightly adhesive. And until all this region here, it was actually, it actually had a, a sort of a, a, a ring shape to it. Sometimes they're very clearly obvious on the center. You pour the hot chocolate in, the, uh, the mold starts to cool. And as it's shrinking or contracting or taking on a smaller volume, it shrinks away from the mold. And yet the part that's still warm it doesn't pull it doesn't pull away till the end so the the best way to avoid that is actually you can use colder temperature at the beginning but then you have to almost like back off on the coldness to give it plenty of time to shrink and set and pull away usually uh this happens when we set it at too rapid of a pace sounds funny but the chocolate uh will do this uh, very repeatedly. And certainly with a 10 pound bar, it can turn into a very big uh, ring. And uh, on, a, on the flatter the surface, the more obvious it is as well. All right, thank you. Uh, Jean, would you like to open your, um, turn on your video and, haha, wonderful. Hello, um, Nelia. Hello, everybody. Um, my question, I use a tempering machine. 
And then I set it at 45, I'm talking about Celsius now, and um, then start filling the molds at 32. But then sometimes I able to, I'm able to release some of the chocolates without any problem at all when I turn it over, when I turn the mold over. Then the other ones don't pop out as easily. I don't know why if it's in, coming out of this at the same temperature and um, it is one mold, some of it pops out, um, releases easily and the others don't. Okay. Um, the, well, uh, let me see if I can find my mold picture for you. Hang on. <laughs> As we say, a picture's worth a thousand words. I'm gonna scoot through some of my uh, slides here. Um, I had some that are showing uh, oh, Monterey, California. Okay, <laughs> that was my cue that I, I needed to wake up. Okay. Uh, okay, I'm afraid those mold, those mold pictures, darn it, they didn't make it in here. Okay, so uh, what I wanted to get to the point, um, when we uh, pour the mold, the chocolate, uh, it takes us time. And the temperature of the chocolate when it's filling into the mold can be changing. So we may be filling at the perfect temperature and then the temperature could actually be changing slightly. Uh, that's one effect. The other effect is when we talk about a mold, all the, uh, each, each part of the mold has a different um, position. And the position of that mold is different relative to the cooling. So the left side of the mold might be very cold and the right side of the mold might be hot or maybe not extremes, but there could be a variation. Also, if we have say a mold that has many cavities so many positions for forming the bar, the ones in the center might not be cooling off as fast as the ones along the edge. Again, just because of the thermodynamics and the cooling process. Um, otherwise, I would be uh, paying very close attention to be sure that I'm monitoring the temperature of my chocolate. When it's, uh, am I filling, am I pouring by hand from a, a bowl? Am I running the chocolate through some kind of filler funnel? I mean, what is your mechanism exactly? Okay, I'm, I'm using a temper machine. So I just sort of, it's coming out of a spout. Okay. Once I get it to 32, then I start to fill. But you said something about if it's got a lot of cavities, because yes, it may have like 28 cavities. So I think what I'm going to do, this is really interesting, it's a little, a little fun. I'm going to look at where I'm having challenges with releasing from. Is it in the middle? Is it at the ends? Is it, this, this, this is something that I'm going to do. It's really interesting. Thank you. Okay, you're welcome. That's a good start. And you can always email me back and ask me if it doesn't work out. <laughs> okay. That would be great. Thanks. All right, sure. It's good. That's true for everyone. Thanks for your question. Yes, thank you. Okay, we have some more questions in the chat. Uh, Darren Hernandez, would you like to come and ask your question or would you like me to go ahead and ask your question? Let me see, where's Darren? Hello, good morning. Are you hearing me? Oh, good afternoon. Yes, perfect. Okay, so um, I'm I'm now starting out. Um, I'm doing it um manually. Um, I basically I do like a two-fold tempering. I do like a two beat, and then I do seed. So I just do that to ensure that my chocolate is tempered. I'm not sure if I'm overdoing it. So basically, how can you tell if your final chocolate is over tempered? Are there any signs? Because uh, I can identify if the chocolate is under tempered with respect to the bloom, but are the visuals the same for over tempered chocolate? Thank you for your question. I'm going to, um, I'm, hopefully you see my screen and I'm going to um, go through, uh, here's, here's what the chocolate looks like. I'm going to um, try to activate here. Okay, so I start with a solid bar of chocolate in this little example and I melted it down. 
Here's the partial melt. Here's a little more melt. Here's the final melt. Right when it's tempered, it holds its shape very nicely. Uh, this is showing you a temper test. Now, this slide, I'm hoping I can open up a little bit and show you uh, the top part of this is not visible for some reason, but um, there's a, a hot temperature up at the top. I have three little pieces of paper, wax paper, laid out on a cookie sheet. And I've labeled each one with the temperature. I'm gonna check the temper, I'm gonna test it. And this is how I do it. I take a little piece of paper. If I think I have the chocolate in temper, I allow it to bend in the middle or fold. And I'm approaching the surface of the chocolate that I believe is tempered. And I'm noting what temperature I have. I touch it to the surface and you see it comes in full contact. And now we know that chocolate's gonna stick to that paper. We lift it up and we can see that it's left a nice little mark on the paper. We set that paper down on our cookie sheet. And what we've achieved is what's called a temper test. There of course are uh, very uh, fine devices designed with all the physics in mind to check our liquid chocolate for us and give us a reading. So these, these temper meters exist, but this is a very quick and accurate way to go about it yourself. If you see that the chocolate holds that ridge, if you mark down what temperature it's at, if you believe it's in temper, you will see that chocolate go from that shiny liquid state to solidified in about three minutes. And in the meantime, your chocolate's just sitting there waiting for you. You keep it away from drafts. You're working by hand, so you have to control its environment. If you are uh, approaching the temperature temper from the hot side, my top slide is a 33 degree or 92 Fahrenheit. So I started taking this series of tests from the hot side. I, the top one is a piece of paper. Again, I had three pieces of paper, dipped each of them at the different temperatures. If you wanted to keep cooling the chocolate and, and measure it again, you might find it getting thicker and thicker. When it sets up, the results will reveal a white haze across the surface. Okay, so I've just given a big answer so that the whole group will benefit from the general uh, idea of how to check temper. And for you specifically, whatever temperature you're at, make note of it, do a temper test like this, let it sit on the, um, on the cooling area for a while, three, two, three minutes, you'll see it solidify. If it forms with a white haze on the top, you're over-tempered. Also, if you're too far below the melting point of the cocoa butter, it's going to also give you this white haze. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, for that. Thank you. Okay, good. You're welcome. Next question. Okay, let's see what we have. Next question. Okay. Can Ken in Hawaii, would you like to come in and ask your question or shall I ask the, I can ask the question for you. You go ahead. All right, yes sir, thank you. So Ken says, I have, I temper with the Choco Vision Rev Delta. Sometimes when it says liquor is in temper, I can still get bloom in the spoon test. Is there a process to recover the batch? Okay, first of all, I want to ask Ken, um, what is the, uh, what's the outside temperature there in Hawaii and what time is it? Uh, right, right now it's uh, 5.02 and it, outside temperature is 64. The inside temperature is 69 where I'm currently tempering chocolate. 
Okay, very good. Thank you. I appreciate the facts and figures. Uh, being a scientist, that always appeals to me. Um, and um, I just need the question read one more time. It's about the Chaco vision. So just quickly read through it again, please. Okay, sure. Uh, let's see. You want me to read the whole the whole comment again? The last the last the last two sentences. Uh, let's see. just jump in the middle. Okay, it says when the machine when when it says liquor is in temper, I can still get bloom on the spoon test. Is there a process to recover the batch? Okay. Um, number one, I would double check the actual temperature with an auxiliary temperature a thermometer. If you have an instant read, um, either a dial thermometer with a stick or, um, you know, I love the, um, the kind of point and shoot or the infrared thermometer is great. Um, if you have that, uh, it'll, it'll help you a lot because um, what, um, whatever the machine is telling you, it sounds like it's, it sounds like it's not quite right for the chocolate. So again, we want to, we want to make the chocolate happy, right? Um, so I would uh, definitely check the temperature. My guess is that it's a little bit cold for what the chocolate needs. And it's entirely possible that whatever wonderful, we don't talk about this drill down very often. I always like to say cocoa butter is cocoa butter world round. But when we come to these difficult points, sometimes the actual melting point of the cocoa butter makes a difference. So depending on what, uh, you know, what world so sources of cocoa you have, it's possible that you have maybe a lower or higher melting point cocoa butter than average than what the machine thinks you should have. So um, long story longer, just to say that um, number one, check your temperature. I would increase the temperature by one degree if at all possible, because if you're getting a haze on that chocolate right away, it usually means a little bit over tempered. I have to ask you though, Ken, is the chocolate a little thick when you look at it at that point? Um, sometimes, yes. And it does get a haze on the, uh, on the uh, spoon. And I am using a thermal gun and uh, they are not calibrated between the machine and the thermal gun. So I can make some adjustments. I would um, definitely um, set aside some time to make all those things work better for you. Those are all good tools and have them all synchronized and calibrated. And I think it will go a little bit better. Um, mostly, I like what you're doing is you're listening to what the chocolate's telling you. And uh, again, it's very good to do what the chocolate wants, no matter what the machines are telling us. So uh, I, I, my judgment is if you get graying right away, it's uh, too cold. It needs, it needs to be warmer because the cocoa butter is already over tempered. And that may very well be what's going on. Thank you very much. I, I grow it. my own cacao and I press my own butter. Uh, I am single you're, source. You're, you're bringing me to tears. I was, um, I was afraid you were going to say that it's, um, it just, it's just such a joyful thing to hear. Thank you for that. Thank you. Okay, I would like to um, invite uh, Joanne. She has a, there's a question in the chat, but also Joanne sent the pictures um, of her chocolate beforehand, which we asked invited folks to do. Thalia, do you have those pictures and her comments? Um, I, I definitely have her pictures. Again, you have to um, bear with me as I, here we go, right? Look familiar? Um, let me see. Well, let's invite her to come. Come here. We go. Here we go. Yes, that's one I know for sure. And this is the other one. Yes. Yes. Right. I'm gonna ask them to unmute and see you. Hey. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. 
Hi. Um, thanks you. Thank you for being here. Um, yeah. So I'm working on the West Coast here, and uh, I had a lot of trouble with tempering, and um, I realized that uh, the biggest problem I had it was during the cool down and moisture and room temp uh, during the cool down, and uh, this is like back like six months ago when I was uh, molding my bars, uh, this, this one as well. And, um, and I figured out that I was over tempering or I was cooling too quickly. Um, but it, it was kind of because of the, of the place and the facility where I was working. And um, now I kind of figured out, but I still have uh, a, a pretty simple question is like, what's the best way to cool down uh, the chocolate? And um, you you just talked about it before, but yes, I do sometimes have like a small film on the top of my chocolate. So I suppose it's over tempered, but uh, I'll let you speak about that maybe. Okay, well, that sounds great. And um, I just wanted to ask you, west coast of where? Uh, Vancouver, BC. Okay. Very good. So a, lot, a lot of rain and a lot of moisture in the air and uh, cooler temperature who, who I didn't realize for a long time that doesn't really help you at the end to have a cooler room. In fact, now I have a dehumidificator who remove um, the moisture and warms up the room as well from like 12 degrees mm -hmm. Celsius to almost like 19 20 degrees celsius so yeah yeah i was going to ask you what remedies you had found so that's excellent yes i would say um with this is this is an um, anomaly as we say okay so <laughs> um that's why globally chocolate has all different challenges uh no we don't want the chocolate to be chilled during the actual pouring of our molds and let me ask, are you pouring from a tempering machine or is this by hand? Uh, so now I'm using a tempering machine. Um, I've done it by hand for a long time uh, and I had better results by hand, in fact. <laughs> and I was very frustrated for a very long time using tempering machine. And um, yeah, it's... Uh, I, I think the, 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 as I say, the one problem I still have is like this, this like kind of a shiny film when I pour my chocolate into the mold and uh, yeah, the cooling, the, the, the cooling, it's uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't. And it's still very, very frustrating. Yeah, it I is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So um, let me address a couple of things that are specifically in your picture. And I uh, appreciate what you're saying as your overall experience, because I think that's what caused a lot of us to be on the call here today. So I think um, there's definitely a shared reality about what goes on in manufacturing. Uh, uh, also, I appreciate that you're taking steps to improve your environment. Again, is the chocolate happy? It doesn't matter what the machines say. It doesn't matter what the thermometers say. Is, is the chocolate happy? So I first want to address the slide that I have on the screen because it's almost beautiful, even though um, it looks so unfortunate. Um, but there's definitely a hot spot that's... Um, something's too hot that's causing part of this to melt out so that your actual chocolate at the time that this was deposited was was non-homogeneous or ununiform or not all the same i went into a factory recently um, they were doing most of the things by hand they had a little small tempering machine and uh, they were trying to scale up get away from hand and move on to this machine and I started checking temperatures throughout the machine, just very sort of like um, microclimates within the machine. And there were uh, the temperature was all over the place. So the, the device was designed to be used that they were using was to be continuously agitating. And it was a wheel type tempering machine. Is that by any chance a wheel type tempering machine you're using? Uh, no, I'm using a very small uh, continuous tempering machine, but um, okay. after doing some research, uh, the temperature that shows me on the machine and what is 
the temperature, the actual temperature of the chocolate, it's quite different by, by a couple right. degrees Celsius, but right. this makes right. a big difference. <laughs> Perfect. Well, I'm glad you've learned that because yes, it does. And what this slide again looks like is that there's, um, you know, it's actually, it's too hot. The poor chocolate is growing large crystals in those veins where we can see the white. This is where we have slow crystal growth. So I want people to kind of put that away in their brains of what the chocolate's doing. Uh, the chocolate's doing what it does. It's gonna crystallize eventually. It's crystallizing in very large crystals because it was too hot. It was above its melting point. We want it to be just below the melting point of the cocoa butter. So glad you paid attention to your temperatures. And on this one, is there anything else you wanted to say, Johan? Uh, this, I suppose, is just I sent it because it was kind of cooling down too quickly. So, yeah. It, it, yeah, it kind of was cracking all the time. And yeah. um, I, I, I just have another question uh, still regarding the first one, the first slide. Okay. Okay. Um, I, when I was like cooling down those ones, uh, what it was very weird for me is the front side of the chocolate bar. So the, the, the nice side uh, was always nice and shiny and looking good. <laughs> and it was just the backside. And, and I think a lot of people have trouble with this. They really have the mold side uh, looking good and the backside uh, looking really bad. So how come the crystal are always coming up and not going down? <laughs> I was, I was, I'm so happy you said that. I'm just, I'm so happy you said that because again, just to be good and warmed up for this event today, I did some of my own bar tempering yesterday. And I said, actually, what everybody wants to know is how do you make the backside look good? And there you go. You, you said it for me. So um, exactly that. Why? Heat rises. So the cold part, so the part that gets cold first is the part that's against the mold. So Think about the chocolate, think about microclimates, think about just the temperature on the surface versus the temperature on the back versus the sides versus the bar in the middle of the form as opposed to the bars on the edge of the form. So you've got the heat coming from the bottom, moving up through the back of the chocolate. So you have the slowest growth actually uh, at the top surface, except it's the surface, so you see it set, but the chocolate inside is still releasing heat and it still releases heat and it still releases heat. So if you're, if the top bar of the bar like this one had veins or streaks through it or rivers through it that were hot chocolate, those are gonna keep absorbing the heat. The heat is gonna move through them. So the heat that's leaving the bar is traveling through channels or pores that pull it right through what was the more liquidy chocolate. And eventually it'll set, but it was the slowest growing crystals. So the back looks the worst for any defects because it gets all the heat from the bottom side. Yeah, it totally makes sense. Thank you so much. You're welcome and thanks for sending in. I appreciate your participation. Thanks a lot. Okay, so forgive my tempering ignorance, but I have a question. Um, so <laughs> uh, maybe it was answered, but so how how does he prevent that? How do folks prevent the problem that he was describing? Yeah, well, very uniform use of temperatures before he pours the mold. So we want to be sure that if we're using a mechanism to dispense the chocolate, if, if it never touches our, you know, we, if we have no control over sort of gathering up that chocolate before we put it into the mold, we have to verify that the, the chute that the chocolate's coming through is not overheated for some reason. That's a typical reason that that type of defect occurs is that um, there's some part of the machine that's overheating the chocolate in one tiny little spot and it's defeating the uniformity of the whole temperature of the whole mass. Does that make sense? 
but it's a mechanical, it's mostly a mechanical thing and it, it needs to be overcome either by better stirring if we actually have our hands in it or by um, I'd say machine maintenance. We need to take a deep dive into where all the heating elements are and cooling features are in our machine. And honestly, um, anybody who owns a, a chocolate tempering machine, it's critical to know how are, what are all the little places that that machine has heaters and what are all the little tricks that machine uses to cool? Because whatever device we're using, it has to function to heat and cool chocolate. If it's cooling only based on the room temperature, then your room has to have what we call a driving force. The room has to be cold enough, just like in Vancouver. It needs to be cold enough to drive the temperature down unless the machine has some source of cooling. Our sous vide friends have to add ice to their heating device. So those are the either the something in the environment has to provide cooling or the machine provides cooling. And they all provide heating. Where, it, where are those heat sources? I've deconstructed some tempering machines and found six or eight sources of heat. And that's great as long as everything's working. If a certain control goes out of balance, it's going to overheat. If, it, if one of the parts fails, it'll underheat. So those are, those are some of the real fine points if we're running into troubles and always have at least a, a calibrated or some kind of standardized thermometer method of te che checking the temperature. Great, thank you. In a, in a similar vein, I just wanna make sure um, that um, the information was received or given. Um, Sander asks us to go back to Ken's question about if he's finding bloom on the spoon in the it, for the batch, obviously there's something gone awry. How does he rescue that batch? And oh. Sandra's question is, does he heat it back up past 90 degrees Fahrenheit and start cooling again? Can you, can you speak to that? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I'm sorry, I was too brief about that. Uh, the, um, I, would in, I would increase the temperature one degree Fahrenheit. Um, and that would be, you know, half a degree Celsius. So I would, I would start to improve the process one half degree at a time uh, Celsius or one degree Fahrenheit at a time and uh, until the problem goes away and it will surprise you. And I'm gonna talk about the other end of the spectrum. If that spoon were dipped in and it came out shiny, but it had a few sort of spots on it or a few shinier spots on it. Sometimes there's some streaks. I tried to depict them in my slides. That's a symptom of under temper. In that case, if the spoon or the temper test comes out like that, we want to uh, decrease the temperature. So the haze is a symptom of over temper, which is either too big or too many crystals, or under temper would be little shiny streaks on an otherwise okay surface. And then we reduce the temperature because there's not there are not enough crystals. We wanna get lower below the uh, melting point of the cocoa butter. So we're dancing very carefully around the melting point of cocoa butter here. And I wanna mention, drill down, especially for people like Ken, who've got their own cocoa beans that they're relying upon. Uh, we, we think of cocoa butter as having a melting range. Even though we call it melting point, that's an abbreviation. It's actually a range and it can be broader for cocoa butters from different regions. It could be shifted lower or shifted higher. So very much so, once you master the tempering for your Hawaii chocolate, that's it. You can be sure no one else is gonna come along and try to temper it any better than you can. Because that's the art of it is adjusting your techniques and your technology to the needs of the cocoa butter. Hopefully, Sandra, that rounded out the answer a little bit. 
Hey, thank you. Okay, uh, Lucia has a question. How long should <coughs> cocoa liquor be held at the cooling temperature before reheating? Oh, very good question. Mm. Okay, what we're trying to do at the cold temperature, let's talk about why we do it. Um, the cold temperature is um, a way of, in physics terms, it's overcoming the activation energy for crystallization. So we're activating the crystals. We're taking those languishing, floating, relaxed, hot molecules, and we're chilling them down and we're trying to snap them into place. It's just like um, buttoning a button or zipping a zipper. We're trying to conform those molecules to each other. So we force them to a colder temperature, also translates lower energy state. So we force those molecules to line up. Now, if we have a very large mass of chocolate that we're treating to this cold temperature, we need to give it a little longer because there's also heat transfer. We've got to get the coldness to a bigger group of molecules and we've got to let the heat leave from a bigger mass. In our uh, big commercial tempering machines here at Guitar Chocolate, we run what's called a thin film cooling with lots of agitation. So that chocolate is only exposed to the cold temperature for an instant, just for, for a couple seconds at the most, and it moves on. So if I've got a big bath of 50 pounds of chocolate in a melter, are you, I hope everyone's still with me. Um, and uh, I um, move that melter, um, or rather if I have a big bath melter, then I need to give that mass more time at the cool temperature than that one instantaneous um, temperature. So what mass, my question back to you is, what mass are you um, working with? How, what weight of chocolate? Lucia, would you like to come oh, forward? Oh, there we go. Yes, it's about um, uh, four, Three, 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 um, three kilos. Okay. Uh, and are you doing it by hand or with a device? By hand. Okay. Um, and what temperature is your room? Um, well, I'm in the tropics, so it's it varies depending on the weather condition outside. So I would say about um, it's between 20, 20, 28 to maybe about 31, depending on the um, conditions. Yeah. Okay. And, okay, and you're trying, so what we're using for what we call our driving force or the cooling is the um, room temperature. Do I have that right? Well, what I used to, um, I use a, a water bath, a cool bath. Oh, very good. And what temperature do you keep that water bath? I, tr well, um, I never really measured the water bath, the temperature of the water bath. What I did, what I do is to measure the temperature of my, um, the liquor, the, co um, yeah. the chocolate. Right. So I try to work with at 40, um, between 82 to, um, 84 Fahrenheit. Okay. I'm going from one, um, temperature. That's great. Thank you. <laughs> um, okay. My, um, okay, so uh, I think it would be an interesting step. First of all, I don't know quite how long it takes, but I'm gonna say your cold temperature will be until you start to see the mass begin to thicken. Right. And uh, then you bring it back up. But here's, because you will visually see the viscosity change, the fluidity, whatever yeah, Yes, we I want. noticed that. Sorry, right? yes, I noticed right? that. So, and the reason that's so, again, we want everybody to stay on the same page here, is those molecules are transitioning from being a liquid to being a solid. Mm -hmm. Something like this chocolate becomes thick because now we've got, we've solidified, you're succeeding, you've solidified some of the cocoa butter molecules. <laughs> and so we want to, we don't know quite how many we're going to need, and your operation is going to be a little different than everyone else. So I'm not going to do any predictions, but in general, what you need to focus on is um, 
uh, start learning what your water temperature is. So we don't want the water temperature to ever drop below 65 degrees. And this is even true in our chocolate factory. I've tr been troubleshooting um, in other factories and over the years, um, for one of my favorites was up in Seattle. We couldn't figure out what was wrong, very much like our friend in Vancouver. Um, uh, but the groundwater, the temperature of the water was uh, like 38 degrees. It was really cold. When the chocolate's exposed to those very cold temperatures, it will take on one of the less stable states. Again, we're trying to force this form. We, we, chocolate will set up in many different shapes, but we want it to set up in the shape that's stable at room temperature, because we're gonna do business at room temperature. Our consumers are gonna start seeing it at room temperature. So <clears throat> uh, we want this temperature stability. We don't want the cold melting ones. We don't want cold water. The chocolate will set, the chocolate will thicken, but the, if the water is below 65 Fahrenheit, so um, try to stay uh, above 19 Celsius. Okay, so that, that is important to know, your water temperature. And it feels so strange when you pick up a thermometer and you put it in water when everybody says, don't ever get water and chocolate, but have maybe another thermometer, have a towel ready, do something so that you can keep your chocolate from getting water in it. But <clears throat> know your water temperature. <clears throat> and for the, um, <clears throat> excuse me, for the three kilos you're talking about, I would say that you're gonna probably need to keep it at that temperature for um, maybe once, you, once, you, once your chocolate temperature reaches 82 or 83 degrees uh, Fahrenheit, I would, um, I would uh, leave it there just until I see the mass uniformly thick, that I know that I've gotten the mass uniformly at that temperature, and that's enough. And then I uh, take it off the cold water, and I start using just the room temperature to do my rewarming. How do you do further rewarming is my next question back um, to you. I use a, a, a um, double boiler method. Okay. I, yeah. And what temperature is your water? And again, and again um, perhaps that's where I am. Um, I need to improve on is to measure the water of the um, the water bath, the hot water bath. Very good. I would not exceed ninety five degrees Fahrenheit, which is somewhere around thirty five. <clears throat> yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't exceed thirty five uh, Celsius with my okay. hot water. All right. Uh, now, the chocolate's going to be cooling your water. You're going to have to reheat the water a little bit. You maybe put it on a super low temperature over the stove. But, you know, there, there are ways to start to learn to balance once, you, once you're clued into knowing that you need to worry about your water temperature. And what I want to say, Lucia, for the whole group is, again, it doesn't matter what size equipment we're using. This is a common problem in chocolate manufacturing is that we are trying to control the process by controlling the chocolate temperature. In fact, we have to control the sources that are controlling the chocolate temperature, if it's air or water. And it doesn't matter how big of a factory you're running, this is a very common problem. Even in some of the complicated tempering machines, a valve will stick, it's not providing cooling water, and nobody knows it for a day or two, or they have to call in a so-called chocolate expert to help them figure it out. So um, you, can, you can instantly raise your status as a chocolate expert by starting to look at your water temperatures uh, coming and going from heating the chocolate, because um, <clears throat> if you have any kind of water cooling, the chocolate is handing off its heat to the water, right. or the water is handing off its heat to the chocolate. So very good question, Lucia. Thank you for that. Thank you very much. OK, we have some more questions in the chat. Larry uh, Abram, would you like to come forward and ask your question? Hi, hello. Hello, welcome. Um, well, this is Larry Abraham from the Cocoa Research Center in Trinidad. So sometimes, well, my question was really about um, viscous chocolate. Uh, most times I notice like with viscous chocolate, it's very, of course, very difficult to handle. And um, most times you will have to uh, 
you end up with scarring of the bars and you probably have to, to remelt and retemper and go through the process again. So the question really was any tips from on your side with regard to like viscous chocolate tempering? Great question, Larry. Thank you. It's very nice to hear from you from Trinidad today. And what is your outside temperature today in Trinidad? Just wondering. Um, today is probably about 33 degrees. Okay, Celsius, great. <laughs> which might be 90 something Fahrenheit. <laughs> okay. Um, and then uh, in your in your workshop, I'm assuming you have air conditioning, then you can select your temperature. Yeah, I normally set the temperature at around 22, uh, 23. And um, even though it's at that temperature, sometimes it may not really be the actual temperature in your room. It could be a little bit warmer than that. Okay, um, so um, now, and one last question, is the chocolate thick because of the primary composition, the ratio of cocoa butter to cocoa mass to yeah. sugar? So, You're making these masses uh, low or rather high viscosity or low fat on purpose? Yeah, so this is basically a two ingredient chocolate, 70, 30%, well, 30 sugar, 30% sugar, 70% cocoa. And um, yeah, so basically it's that. And I guess it probably has to do with the genetics of the bean because yeah, some chocolates um, at the same ratio that may not be as viscous as, you know, a certain other chocolate. Okay, so um, again, very broadly, because you are making chocolate, uh, this may not apply to people who are, you might say, users of chocolate as opposed to makers. So this is this is a good maker's question, and it comes from like being exposed to lots of problems here in the plant. So we just want to, um, yes, I understand that genetics of the plant is going to lead to some differences in <clears throat> in the viscosity of the chocolate, um, and I'm. From my experience, you tell me if it's different for you. That would be because of the natural proportion of cocoa butter that comes from the plant. Is that true? Um, I suppose. Um, maybe, maybe no, not. Uh, maybe, maybe not. Sure. I mean, if you add cocoa butter, like if it's a, a chocolate that includes cocoa butter, of course it's going to be less viscous is going to be fluid but there was some chocolate like this week i didn't really i don't know we could have sent in pictures and whatnot but um this week i had a chocolate a particular chocolate that i had to remelt it was just 18 bars i would do i was doing and i had to remelt because it all came out it was very viscous no i use um by hand tempering by hand where i actually use a ladle to pour out into the mold so it's not like a machine and a spout so to speak so it was very, very viscous and um, I remelted and some of it came out. I mean, well, most of it came out better the second time around, but I still had like about four bars that had a bit of scarring. Right. So, okay. Okay. So let me, let me make a couple more comments about thickness. <clears throat> thickness can be generated from too much pre-crystallization. So we, we go through tempering in order to convert invisibly convert some of the liquid chocolate or some of the liquid cocoa butter into solid. So again, just to keep kind of bringing back to that fundamental point, the tempering process is intending to move the needle from liquid to solid slowly. So slowly we have developed some pre-crystallization. Um, and then if we overdo it, if we go too far for many of these reasons that we're discussing, we get too much solids and too many solid cocoa butter crystals, and it becomes too thick. It's approaching solidification. So that's one problem. If the mass is lacking in cocoa butter, because cocoa beans have cocoa butter, right? That's where you're getting it from. You're not adding cocoa butter, it sounds like. So right. you have to rely on the cocoa beans to give you all the fluidity that you're going to get. <clears throat> now, there's one other thing, moisture. And this is, um, I don't know how much this has been discussed in the uh, chocolate maker circles, but um, we have to be sure <clears throat> that we are releasing an adequate amount of moisture in the roasting and further processing. Uh, because 
<clears throat> excuse me, otherwise that moisture hangs around and it interrupts the flow of the chocolate and it resists the flow of the chocolate and we get the um, thickening through moisture. And that's why we don't, we don't add, the, we don't wanna add moisture to it, of course, ever, because it thickens it. Likewise, if we don't get the moisture out from roasting and processing, the moisture is gonna just sit around and thicken the chocolate forever. Right. So we have to, and, and it, it's two components, no lecithin. We don't have any lecithin around to help mitigate some of these moisture issues. So um, I would say you, you would probably, I, myself, I would wanna know an analysis at some point of what my uh, total fat content is of my, uh, my ground chocolate, my cocoa beans, and then of my finished chocolate mass to know if you're even in range, what to expect of your chocolate. On the other hand, over-tempering is the most common reason, having generated too much solid matter before you try to ladle it out. And just running at one, just bump the temperature up by um, half a degree Celsius until it thins out. See if yeah, it'll do I, that. I, I, think, I think sometimes that's what you know, what I have to do, like at least with the temperature, because of course the temperature will kind of free up the chocolate a bit more, make it a little bit more. Um, Great to know. Great really to know. Yeah. Great to know. So graying, if it grays out right away uh, upon cooling, if it um, or forming a white haze on the surface, if it um, acts too thick, usually we can just bump it up very slowly in temperature. And we watch, again, we're moving the needle from too many or too much uh, solidification to less solidification and it gets more more fluid so i hope that works yeah thanks sure i just have one question though one other question um yeah. i mean we're talking about the chocolate mm -hmm. and actually and tempering the, the chocolate itself but you know the final product also results from the um the final product depends as well on the temperature of your of your of your mold as well as temperature of your cooling device whether it's a chiller or a fridge or something so like what is like the optimal temperature of the mold yeah. as well as your cooler yeah um uh two things about that if if we're at the ladling stage if we're filling molds by hand usually if we are comfortable in the room and the mold is the same temperature we are that's adequate i've seen um Lots of uh, people try to warm the molds from 70 degrees Fahrenheit or 22 Celsius up to, um, you know, maybe something more like um, 25 Celsius just for the sake of the mold. And it's it adds an operation that's kind of unnecessary if we have everything else under control. The chocolate's not really going to care if it's going into a uh, 22 or 25 or 26 degree mold. Okay, but if we're uh, running an, a big operation, it's more critical to have the chocolate close or the mold closer to the chocolate temperature. When we run our big depositing lines that go through um, these massive cooling tunnels, we have to have the molds at uh, what would be 86 degrees Fahrenheit or 87, as close to the chocolate temperature as possible. Okay. But don't, don't, and, and I would just want, let me just add on one more thing. Um, if we've um, just released the bars from the mold and say we had the, it was is necessary to cool the, the bars in the refrigerator, which I don't agree with because of condensate issues. I just want to warn people that if the molds have hit the dew point, meaning transition from cold to hot uh, extremes, we get this moisture film and that's absolutely unfriendly to the chocolate. This, that's not, we can't use, that's not acceptable. We cannot use molds that have uh, condensate on them. So the molds have to be warm enough to not be chilly or um, to, um, you know, to cause the chocolate to have the, this condensate. Not that. Okay, hope that helps. Yeah. All right. 
We do have a few more questions in the chat, but uh, there's a hand raised. It just says iPhone user. And I noticed in the chat that this particular person's having worry that their battery is gonna die. So as a, I'm, I'm gonna get to those questions in the chat, I promise, but I'm gonna go ahead and invite the iPhone user to come in and ask their questions before their battery dies. <laughs> Hello, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, I'm enjoying the, the, the webinar. Um, I'm, I'm from Martinique. My name is Lily. Uh, I'm a chocolatier and I have my, uh, my own cocoa plantation as well. So I'm doing from the tree to the chocolate bonbon. Um, now, um, I'm using Cocoa Town uh, grinders uh, to process uh, the chocolate. And I started using not long ago a sell me tempering machine. And I've noticed from tempering by hand and tempering the Fermi machine, um, I get issues. And I don't know if it's due to temperature or if it's due to, um, I, I'm, I'm honestly not sure. Um, and I've just, I just heard that you can't put it in a fridge. It's not recommended. But what I was doing is um, tempering, putting it in a mold and, um, putting it in a fridge to cool down very quickly for 10 minutes and then putting it at 15 degrees afterwards. So, um, and even that, I noticed with the machine, I have traces, lines. When I was tempering by hand, I didn't have those, those lines. So I'm not sure where I go wrong. Okay. Um, I have to say, I have to say, I don't add cocoa butter in the chocolate. I just really do the bean and the brown sugar. And so sometimes, depending on the bean, some chocolate are very runny and sometimes it's very thick. And I've noticed also, I have to change my tempering uh, degrees, temperature, depending on the thickness of the chocolate at, at, when I start working with it. Okay. Very, very good questions. What was your name again, please? I'm sorry, it doesn't show on the screen. My name, Lily. Lily? Okay, Lily, thank you. Um, these are these are all excellent questions. Um, uh, and it's quite quite a wide range of things. Um, so again, with when you get some streaks in the chocolate, uh, it's important to be sure that you adjust, you might want to just simply make an adjustment lower, lower the temperature half a degree Celsius. Begin with a lower temperature if something's coming out streaky. Why? Because those streaks represent streams of hot chocolate that are forming into your mold. So think about why they're there and then the remedy would be something needs to, if something is too hot, so something needs to cool down. In general, um, be sure that your environment, so um, some places have uh, other things going on in the room and just the spout might, the metal of the spout sometimes just gets hot because of the conditions where it's being operated. So be sure there, there's nothing too hot or too cold in the environment of the tempering machine. And okay. um, you, you uh, probably will get uh, good results if you start to focus on checking the chocolate temperature with an extra thermometer and be sure that chocolate's happy and get cross check for all measurements different from what the device is telling you. Always double check. This is uh, across all kinds of problem solving. Always double check our temperatures. Okay, okay. And right. if, there is a, if there is a way I can know the, um, the tenure, of the, the amount of cocoa butter I may have um, in the chocolate. Oh. Because I'm, I'm, I'm actually guessing right now because of the okay. free, with the free DP. Okay, I, uh, if you're, uh, you said you're composing your own chocolate. I would yes. use I would use one of the universities to uh, ask their their food science or agriculture department 
to help you measure the fat content of your chocolate. Okay. Okay. And and that's it's that simple. It's a it's a fairly simple chemistry test that should be performed. Those of us that have access, we use what we call a third party lab. We contact a business who runs an analytical laboratory. Um, at Guitard, we ha have the luxury of having our own analytical instruments, but the universities have these same capabilities and they should be able to help you. Okay, I will do so. I will do so. Um, now, um, I, have, I have other questions, but what I do best is I will, I will send some sample of the, of the tablet I'm doing and show exactly what, what it does. Um, but I felt rather than putting the machine at 31 degrees to temper it, I put it at 30.5. That's what I've done. Um, but I've noticed, um, I don't know, maybe the machine is new as well, that tempering by hand is, is quite, it, it, it was more efficient for me. Although you cannot do big batch, and I tempered with um, um, by hand with a, a triangle. So what I do, the marble, because I'm I'm in the tropics, I will put um, some um, you know those those cool those those cooler those cooler um, uh, bricks on it. Yes. To cool it down, because I've noticed if I temper for too long, it's no good. You have to temper quickly, and I would I would put those ice. The, those ice things, it's not water on it. So it's a solid uh, plastic thing that's very cold to cool my, my surface down and then temper on it. So it will drop down the temperature very quickly. And then I will put it up with, the, with a heat gun slowly. And I've noticed this method works very well and all my tablets are shiny. <laughs> but with the machine, it gives me some troubles. I, I understand what you're saying. And again, uh, it doesn't solve the problem, but I just have to say scale up, moving from small to large is often full of lots of problem solving. So I understand where you are. What's good is that you have the firsthand experience with your chocolate and you know you can succeed with it. So you already know it's not the chocolate and you know that it's the device. So I, I know you'll be able to make these, um, uh, these changes because thinking about what the chocolate needs is, is critical. And you'll just thinking it through the chocolate's point of view, if you will, is gonna help you uh, overcome any machine uh, changes. Okay, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you for the meeting. Have a good thank day. You. you too, Lily. All right. We do have a few more questions in the chat and some hand, hands raised. What I'm going to do is um, Isabel hasn't had a chance to ask a question. So I'm going to try to hit the folks that haven't had it because we're running. The time is, is um, you know, running. So, uh, and then if you've got to come back to those who have already gotten to ask a question to get their question. Um, before we move, Teresa, I just wanted yeah. to say there was some concern about getting some questions answered in Spanish. And um, I just want to say, please make room for uh, at least one um, Spanish speaker, and um, I might be able to understand them. So uh, let's. Yes, let's well, I have translated. That's Isabel, and I've translated her okay, question. Great. Okay, great. I don't know great. if you can Thank you. speak the answer in Spanish and English. I that would probably not today, but um, if I if I came down and visited for a while, I'm sure I'd warm up. Okay, so go ahead. Okay. All right. So Isabel's question uh, is, let's see, my, my problem occurs when they are fed into the molds on the shelf for solidification, airflow needed, question mark, what is the ideal um, ambient temperature at that at this stage? Okay, very, very good question. Um, and this is the slide that didn't make it into my deck. I took a slide of the uh, polycarbonate mold filled with uh, liquid chocolate, and I show my polycarbonate molds uh, elevated up on a um, on rails. I have some thin metal bars that I elevate them on. Okay, so that's bare minimum. I like it that you have these on shelves. 
I would point a fan. So um, the airflow has to be, if we have, if we have the chocolate stack, I'm gonna use my hands so we can help with translation here. If we have the chocolate forms stacked vertically, we want the breeze, the airflow to move across the, the molds. And we don't want there to be shadows. We don't want that the any of the molds to be behind uh, some surface that the, the air cannot pass through. So all the molds have to be oriented for good airflow and we may need to space them out further. So uh, those are the, that's the concept and the absolute temperature can be anywhere from uh, 60 degrees Fahrenheit to uh, about the hottest would be about 72. It could be actually could be 55 uh, to 72 Fahrenheit. So um, that that's what my statement is. Can you translate that, Teresa? Oh no, <laughs> I wish I could. Uh, what maybe I know you're a busy lady, but maybe if you have time, can, we'll get we'll get you the questions that came in the yes. chat, and you can yes. answer those, and then they'll yes. be able to get it translated. I would I would love to provide that um, assistance. Yes, and I definitely Wonderful. have co colleagues that'll be able to say this much better than I can. So okay, thank you. Great. All right, I'm moving back up up the list of questions. Um, so Dr. Balu has a question in industrial setup. People use cooling tunnels. What is the role of the cooling tunnel? And if it is important, how a small chocolate maker can simulate what happens in the cooling tunnel? <laughs> so um, very good. I'm glad we're moving on to cooling. This is great. Everybody's <laughs> questions are progressing. Um, function of the cooling tunnel is uh, primarily, uh, we way we think of it, to remove latent heat of crystallization. So I didn't get to this part yet, but um, basically not only does the chocolate need cooling because we see that the temperature is warm and the temperature needs to be colder, but I didn't mention this, as these molecules are snapping into place, they release heat. So this is a property in physics that we call latent heat of crystallization. Again, when those molecules fit together, they release heat. In the cooling tunnel, we need extra cooling at the point where these molecules most frequently crystallize or take shape. And that is usually so-called the center of the cooling tunnel. So what we do in our cooling tunnels is the temperature goes from cool to cooler or cold to colder, and then a little bit warmer at the end to avoid dew point. We run what's called a temperature profile in a big cooling tunnel. In fact, all chocolate that I've ever lived with cools off just fine if I have a good airflow and a proper mm, temperature range given the so-called heat load. So if I have all, my, if I have a, a, a bakery rack, speed rack, a rack chocolate racked up full, full of my hot molded chocolate, I have now created a micro environment that is not favorable to cooling the chocolate because there's so much heat that needs to be released from the warm chocolate and there's so much latent heat of crystallization coming off all those reactions. I need to put a brisk fan of air movement, blow the air, blow the hot air away and replace it with air temperature somewhere between 55 and 70 degrees Fahrenheit, whatever's most favorable. So there's temperature and air movement, Dr. Ballou. That's what we need in a cooling tunnel. And that's what we need to simulate if we don't have a cooling tunnel. Okay, it is 1156. Uh, if everyone is okay, there's one more question. And then we'll we'll sort of start the um, 
the wrap up. All right, so Darren wants to know what affects the stability of the finished chocolate in terms of its hardness in parentheses or snap. That is, the chocolate does not melt too easily or quickly at room temperature. And then he's given us a clue, which is 32 degrees Celsius in Trinidad. Okay. Here's the good news. Once you, uh, once you form the proper crystals that we are calling affectionately form five, and we have these that have the highest melting point possible during manufacture. If we store our chocolate between, uh, between uh, let's just say the manufacturing temperature and the bottom of the cocoa butter melting range, if we store the chocolate only in that temperature range, we don't take it down any colder and we don't exceed the melting point going up into the 90s or exceeding say 34. Okay, if we can carefully keep it in that range, what we do is we continue to breed or encourage the chocolate crystals to maintain a higher and higher melting point. This is good news. This is good news for the hot climates. And I've actually succeeded in storing chocolate for a week at uh, this elevated 30, actually it was 31 Celsius. And I turned the chocolate from being a typical soft and pleasant eating character to actually the exact same bar to having the sensation of eating wax. It became so high melting point because I was able to breed the higher and higher melting point crystals. So this is, this is the magic of the higher temperature. If you're able to keep a stable temperature for a period of time, before you expose it even to your um, 98, I'm looking at 32, if you're able to actually control um, an, a hold environment, and I'll tell you real quick, if you're able to uh, maintain a holding environment for the chocolate uh, between at around 29 Celsius or about 84 Fahrenheit, here's what happens. If you can maintain that for about 48 hours minimum, you encourage all the cocoa butter crystals to line up at the highest possible melting point and you will have the greatest temperature stability. So try that. I talked to an expert from uh, Cadbury who ran chocolate factories around the world. And he said, this, is, this was their trick for uh, causing the cocoa butter to be more stable at the warm climates. So that's, that's about the best we can push the chocolate to. You could try if you wanted to do some extra credit or work with your university. You could try to hold the chocolate, do experiments holding the chocolate temperature at increasingly warm temperatures and see how hot you could breed these cocoa butter crystals. And this would be a function of storage of the chocolate. This is not something that happens in the manufacturing. It's all post-manufacturing after you've formed your bars. Thank you. Okay, I, I don't see any more um, questions in the chat. We are at the top of the hour. Thalia, thank you so much for, for joining us today. Uh, I'm gonna, I see Mrs. Ballou's come back on camera and uh, uh, she'll close us out. So thank you all uh, for your time and all the great questions. And Thalia, thanks for sharing your expertise. And you know, if you still have any questions that you missed asking now, and when you go back and uh, you know, view the recording again, if you have any questions, please, uh, no, please feel free to email us and we will forward it to Thalia and she gracefully agreed to answer all the questions. So once she uh, you know, answers the questions, they will go on the, uh, you know, uh, in our website so you can access it anytime under FAQ and you will also get the uh, link to the recorded webinar after this. So thank you for your time. I know some of you in Philippines and other places are staying up late. Thank you. And some, you know, Thalia had to wake up very early because she's in the West Coast. 
So thank you all for your cooperation. Thank you for making this webinar successful because without the participants, the webinar doesn't have any meaning. So thank you all. Loka Samasta Sukhino Bhavantu. Have a safe day and stay safe and healthy. So hope to see you all in person soon.